Hello, good afternoon everybody. I'm Bill Harriman, Director of Firearms here at the British Association for Shooting and Conservation. And today's Countryside Workshop is going to be about the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners Firearms Licensing Survey. Now this has come in in the aftermath of the dreadful events at Plymouth in August and it uh, really really sprung out of nowhere there was no intimation that the AOPCC was going to do this and I am doing this workshop to firstly to encourage you to fill it in and secondly to give you a steer as to how the answers that you give might be formulated. First of all, what is a police and crime commissioner? A lot of people don't know what they are. Well, they come from legislation in 2011. And if you wanted to sort of paraphrase uh, what uh, the PCC's website says, that they are elected people to be the voice of the people and to hold the police to account. So really, they are a sort of democratic layer inserted into policing to make sure that you, the taxpayer, whose money supports your local police force, has a voice and that the chief constable is held to account by the PCC. The survey, I think, is a bit of a red herring on the basis that we are still waiting for the Independent Office of Police Conduct to investigate the Plymouth shootings. And to la launch a survey like this without having any real hard facts as to what happened in Plymouth in August is potentially, I don't think, very, very helpful. Also, the, the survey is, is not very well written and it, it's full of leading questions. And as a result of those comments that I've just made, you might think that a survey like this, well, it can be safely ignored. But I'm here to tell you that it can't and that my advice is that you should complete it. Now, there's, there are two reasons for, for giving you this advice. Firstly, it's to let the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners know what your views as a certificate holder are on the firearms licensing system that grants and renews your certificates. Secondly, I think it's also very important that you do this because you can bet that those who are not well disposed to shooting will see this as an opportunity and they will try and whip up as much support for an opposing view to firearms licensing as possible. So anything that you can do to confound our enemies has really got to be good. The survey is very simple and the answers in it are mainly binary answers, i.e. it's a yes or no survey. There's nothing very complicated about it. It's free and you can do it online, and it takes you under 10 minutes. And also, um, if you have multiple computers, then uh, there would be uh, the potential for multiple responses, which might uh, reinforce the shooting community's position. I couldn't possibly say that you should do that, but um, some might say that you ought to. The first part of the survey, um, questions one to nine, it's very easy, it's self-evident. They're just sort of uh, demographic building um, questions. And the real meat of the survey, which is the bit that I want to give you some suggestions on, starts at question 10. And I'll, I'll read out question 10 to you. As a member of the public, do you think a medical report should always be provided to the police as part of the process for issuing a firearms license or shotgun certificate? My response to that would be that um, a medical report is actually only a snapshot of 
anyone's medical condition at the time that an examination was made. If you want to think of it in terms of a car MOT, it's about as good as the time that the car drives off the garage forecourt. 20 minutes later, it could be totally different. I believe that medical reports, and they are full surveys of someone's condition, they need to be targeted to address concerns which you might make on the application form in question nine. Also, when you think about it, most firearms licensing staff are not qualified to interpret the contents of such a report and they would have to go to another medical professional to get advice from it. So I would say that a blanket requirement for an applicant to supply a report would be totally dis disproportionate and it really would add nothing to the process. Anything to do with medical involvement in the firearms licensing process needs to be targeted and it needs to be targeted from the questions that are given on the uh, application form and the main one is question nine and the answers that are given to that. We go on to question 11. As a member of the public, do you think a person's medical record should always indicate when they have been granted a firearms license or a shotgun certificate? My view of this is an emphatic yes. For a long time, BASC has been campaigning for an encoded reminder, or sometimes called a marker, that's placed on a patient's medical records that gives a 24-7, 365 early warning of somebody who presents with a condition which might give rise to concerns about their suitability to possess firearms. I have to say that the marker is fundamental to continuing public safety and public, public safety has to be a precondition of the lawful possession of, firing, of firearms. If the public aren't confident, then eventually they're going to say, no, we don't want anybody to have any guns, and uh, bang, we'd go all our sport. Number 12. As a member of the public, do you think that GPs should inform the police if they become aware of changes to a firearms license or shotgun certificate holder's health, which means they may no longer be safe to hold a firearms license? Again, I would say an emphatic yes. I think a doctor has a moral duty to that, to do that. And it helps nobody if somebody is really not suitable to possess firearms because in the event of something terrible happening, you know that the eye of scrutiny is going to come on to the firearms licensing department and also then onto the firearms owning community. So I would say, yes, a doctor has a moral duty to do that. Number 13, as a member of the public, how do you feel about suggestions that the police could in future research a person's social media and other online activities as part of any assessment for issuing a firearms license or shotgun certificate? Well, I, th I think this, this is really way behind the curve on the basis that I know that many firearms licensing departments will look at a person's social media feeds. However, to do it for every applicant for a certificate would mean huge resource implications for the police and as a consequence, I have to say that that is disproportionate. Any such trawl needs to be targeted towards somebody who has come to police attention. And it's then that you get far more benefit from looking at a variety of things, which might include social media feeds. But to have it done for every applicant, I don't really think it's proportionate. It's very, very expensive in terms of resourcing and I don't really think it would add very much to the process. Number 14, as a member of the public, do you think that 
all of the costs incurred by the police and by medical practitioners in processing a firearms license or shotgun certificate should be met by the applicant. And I've been quite emphatic in what I think about the other questions, and I'm going to be so again, except in the negative, I would say no. Fire, firearms licensing is always portrayed as a service to the firearms owning community. But when you think about it, it isn't really a service. You don't get very much for the fee that you pay. And what it actually is, it's a service to the wider public to ensure public safety. It's a screening process to make sure that unsuitable people don't get hold of guns. So if it's a service to public safety, as a consequence of that, the public should pay a significant proportion. And don't ask me to say exactly how much in percentage um, that would need to be discussed of, of, of the cost of a licensing uh, process. We, we're getting uh, accusations that because the cost to the police of running the licensing system isn't covered by the fees, that this is somehow subsidising certificate holders. Well, I would say that actually it's the public investing their money in a process which contributes to their wider protection from harm. So it's not a subsidisation. It's actually a means of reinforcing the safety of the general public. And if that's the case, then the public purse should meet some of the costs. Also, there's another aspect to this. When the current fee levels were set, they were derived from a working group, I happen to sit on it, which sat down and accurately identified, first of all, all of the processes within wider firearms licensing. It then took each one of those processes and asked what level of police staff would do that. The identification of that was then applied to the cost of that person doing it. And from that, we got a series of figures that went totted up and with a small increment added to it to encourage efficiencies through information technology and similar things that gave the, the fee. So that, that was a properly costed fee. It wasn't just something that somebody had just plucked out the air and said, yeah, it should be 200 quid. The, the police were well represented on that group. And I can remember there were three or four pretty senior firearms licensing managers who really knew their stuff, who'd been in post for a long time. And as a result of that, I think that that exercise, which was evidence-led, was really very, very valuable. And that the fee that was arrived at and put into the most recent fees order was accurate. Now, if you had a system that allowed all of the police costs to be passed on to applicants, that would actually reward inefficiency. And it would also encourage the lack of consistency, which there is already, and also defeat, really, any, any notion of accountability within the firearms licensing system. And effectively, if that was the case, then fee levels would be a postcode lottery because some police forces administer the licensing system very well, very efficiently, and others do it very shockingly badly, as the recent BASC survey showed. Question 15. If you had concerns about someone you knew held a firearms license or shotgun certificate, would you pass those concerns on? Well, again, I would have to say there is a moral duty on anybody, in my opinion, to protect public safety because we're all members of the public. And nobody is well served by unsuitable people having access to firearms. It's a thing that you would have to think long and hard about, but I think at the end of the day, if you had really strong concerns, then you would have a moral duty to pass those on. And who would you pass them on to? 
Well, it could only be one person, and that is the police licensing department, because the chief officer has responsibility for issuing the certificate, and only the police can revoke a certificate. So those are my views on what the main part of the survey has to say. Um, you will find them repeated on the BASC website. And I hope that you will take the time, it's only 10 minutes out of your life, to fill this in and let the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners know what you, as a certificate holder, really think about it. And Again, I would say, please take the time to do this. It is important. I know it's a bit of a red herring. It's not very well thought of. It's not very well written. And I shall be writing to the chair of the Association of Police and Crime Commissioners and pointing out where I think this survey is not very efficient. But please do respond to it. Thanks very much.